Okay, good morning, everybody. Wait a few seconds to make sure I can actually see comments. Yes, it looks like it's working. Good morning. Um, my name is Samantha Mirabal, and I am with Melco's application team. This is our design shop talk. We do these every week, so please type in your questions um, into the little comment thing. I'll try to keep an eye on them, so if you see me darting off to the side to look, that's what I'm looking at. Um, I also, if you can type them in ahead of time, you can also email them to applications at melco.com and the team will get them, make sure we get them included. All right. Or if it's something quick, you might get an email back. Good morning, everybody. Okay. So I have a handful, a few questions that came in beforehand. Not a whole lot. I know it's the holiday season and everyone's having a blast with that. Um, I know I am. <laughs> uh, so this, I thought it was funny. I put it up here. Just, good afternoon. Um, I put it up there just because it was asked, um, what do you tell a friend who needs a rush during the holiday season? Uh, honestly, I don't know the right answer for that. Um, I know what I personally do is, you know, if I can do it, I just suck it up and tell them no problem um, and fit it in. It's there gets to a point though when it's sorry I'm too busy at the moment I wish I could it's I've gotten more comfortable with the word no and that's a hard one to do because everyone wants to make their friends happy so it's I don't know <laughs> ah, I'm glad you look forward to them hi there so it's I don't know the right answer I know right for me I just started saying no I, that I can't do it I wish I could um, and I also warned all my friends ahead of time to let me know before December what they wanted so I could plan it. And that worked out well, actually, because I've got a handful of things that I was able to fit in knowing that they were going to, what they wanted helped. All right. So let's see, how do I make rectangles with rounded corners? I've seen it done, but I missed the steps. So I did put a few slides in here just so that you would have them of mainly reminders to myself of um, things to make sure I show you. I'm going to show you how to use this um, automatic custom input tool. All right, so that gives you different selections that you can use those. And then I also want to point out if you've not looked at the um, manual for the software, you should read it. You know, it's if you're just starting off, it's a little overwhelming to read through that thing. It's 220 pages um, roughly. So to read it from start to finish when you don't know anything about digitizing is a little overwhelming. But there, I would suggest um, going through it, you know, doing all the videos as a starting point and then practicing doing a few projects, getting good and dangerous, and then open the manual and scan through it until you can't take it anymore and then do, you know, go back to, you'll learn something. So I know even now I'll ever, I'll go back and skim through it and go, oh, I forgot about that, or, oh, I didn't realize that. So there's a lot of good information in there. So this, there's two pages under wireframe editing commands. If you've never done that, um, read those two pages. They're really good on how to work with wireframes, and that will show you how to create the corners. Um, I did highlight it here and did a crop, but it's just so you have where it's all coming from. All right, so let's go over to Design Shop and take a look at that. Oh, I guess I closed it. I thought it was open. Oops. All right, so the automatic input tool, that's down here. So select automatic custom shape input. If you hold that down, you'll see there's other choices. Right now, we're just going to look at the first one. All right, down here, this will pop up, and this gives you all the different ones. If you've not scanned through them, there's a lot of different designs that you can find down here. Under custom designs, you'll see there's common closed shapes. So these are good um, if you need a basic circle for a patch or an oval, a rectangle, or one of these rounded corner things. So you can, you left click on it, that's all I did, and you can s and drag it onto the screen. Voila, it dumps it out here. Good morning. So you can see that drops it over here for your, you know, viewing pleasure. <laughs> However, you can see how it was built. You can use the elements. Let's say you don't want the fill behind it. Well, I can just delete that and I'm left with an outline. All right. So that's one way is to use these different shapes. They've got filled ones. There's open ones. Um, there's different, sh there's shapes of all sorts. If you go look at, uh, I think it's coming. Nope. Let's see. 
custom shapes. There's even more down here that you can play with. So they work the same way. You select it, drag it onto the screen. This one puts it in as a complex fill. So in those cases, you'd want to go back and, um, you know, do whatever you want with it. If you want it to be a become a outline, let's say just a walk input, I can hold the shift key down and click on the walk input. And if I turn off the fill, you'll see now I just have a running stitch. All right. Um, there's another one here. If I hold control, let's say, instead, I don't want to walk, I just want a satin stitch. I can hold control and click on that. Okay. So you can see that changed my walk input to a single line center. All right, so that's working with these custom shapes. Well, what if you want to draw your own and you want to round the corner? All right, so I'm going to start from new, so I don't, I'm not, <laughs> I don't tend to cheat that way. So I'm going to start with drawing a rectangle. I'm just going to do it as a walk input. And down here, you'll see you also have different, there's an automatic circle or there's an automatic rectangle. So I'm going to left click and drag left click again and that puts me a rectangle. All right, so that's cute except that's not got rounded corners and that's what we want. So I'm gonna go ahead and center that and turn on the grid and let's go ahead and make this a easy size. There we go. So I'm just lining it up with the grid. All right, so let's say I want a half inch radius right here. My grid lines are the large lines here default to half an inch. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna add a left click here at the half inch mark and I'm going to add another left click there so I added two points okay now if I select this middle point I just click on it so now that wireframe point is selected and now if I hold the control key and drag look what it does it rounds it for me so I can round that corner pretty nicely so if I turn off the grid you can see that Okay, so what if you just want to eyeball it? All right, you don't feel like doing it exactly half an inch. Okay, I can left click, left click, click that point, hold my control key down, that's the key, and that's under those wireframe things. And I just left click on that point while holding control on the keyboard and drag. And it makes me a nice perfect arch. So if I go back to that, oops, not there. Oh yeah, here. So under the wireframe editing commands in the manual, you can see control plus drag the point. By holding that control key, you are able to generate a perfect arc between the next and previous points on the line. So that's why I added those two left clicks. All right, was to be able to do that. All right, so what else? Um, control, so I showed that and that works for any shape. So just to demo that a little bit further, so that's with a walk input. Well, what if this were a um, single line center? Okay, so I'm holding alternate this time. So I'm left clicking, holding alternate to keep my lines horizontal. If I wanna seal that shape without clicking on it, I can hold shift enter and that'll automatically close the shape for me by holding the shift key down. And then I can accept the default width, which is currently set to 20, or I can left click and drag to give me a width. Okay, so again, that gives me a nice rectangle, but without the curved corners. So if I wanna curve these corners, you know, I could, where that one is, add two left clicks, select, yeah, those are too close. I don't like that, let's delete it. Doing it again. Uh, let's do back here, that'll be better. So I add two points, select that, hold my control key down, left click and drag. Now I have a curve. Interesting shape there. Okay. So, and just to further that, so I did a single line, a walk input. Well, let's do a fill. Same deal. So if I draw a fill, give it a start point, a stop point, and a stitch direction. So now I want to turn this into a corner. Anytime you want to modify, select the shape you're trying to modify. Now I'm going to add my two wireframe points. Choose the one in between it, hold the control key down and drag. Okay, so you see we've got lots of curves going here. All right, hopefully that helps.
um, with how to round the corners. Okay. So here's another one. Can someone tell me what I need to do to not get this? All right, so you're getting these um, really long stitches in corners. Okay. You would rather have them look like that, but instead you're getting weird stuff like this when you're trying to do different tight corners. So what do we do? All right, design shop. I actually made a file to demo this on. There, corners. All right, so, and I'll draw, the sh I'll draw the shape just so you can see how I drew it, so if you're not aware of how to do that. All I did to create this is I used a single line center, and I'll trace over it just so you can see. I just drew this little crystal, and then I held the shift enter to close the shape, and then I hit enter to accept the default width, and then I decided the default width was too narrow, so I selected the width number up there and turn on my num lock helps and I made it 40 okay so that's how I created that now the, you can see what that did is it kind of made this mess up here all right which is what we want to get rid of so what do we do all right well if you've got the corners option within the software you've got a lot of ability to make changes fast. All right, so let's look at that. I can make it a capped end like this, or I can do, I'll just zoom in like that there. So I can do a capped end, I can do this kind of overlap, or I can miter it. How? So I'm gonna, the red one is the one that's got nothing applied to it. These others already have settings. So I'm gonna double click on the shape I wanna modify, and down here there's a corners tab. So if I turn that on, for caps, that's what this does. It makes your stitches go side to side rather than fanning them around. All right. So when I do that, look at what happened. Now I've got a cap end here. Okay, so that's already better than at least fanning. It'll sew better because if I undo that, what's the downside to this thing? One, it looks pointy on the screen, but if you notice, it's got a million... All right, a million is over exaggerating, but you can see it's got a lot of stitches coming into this tiny little area here, which is not going to sew out very well. Rather than giving you a nice little point here, I find it looks more like a mushroom. It's just not pretty. Okay, so what else can we do? So that's a cap. What if you don't like that look and you want a miter? Well, again, I can double click on the shape, go to corners, turn on miter, apply. Voila, I have a miter. All right, or... There's a miter one, or there's a miter two. Okay, so you see we've got different looks based on what you're going for. All right, now that's with a single line. That's but the example asked about. Well, I've got tackle stitches. All right, so how do I fix that? Again, it's the same thing. If I have the stitch type set to tackle rather than a satin, I gotta quit zooming out. I'm sorry. Hopefully, I'm not making anyone dizzy here. <laughs> If I am, I'm sorry. Okay, so again, I can take that shape, double click on it, come to corners, turn on a cap. And if I move it over, notice it puts all the stitches this way. Well, instead of a cap, I can tell it to miter. And again, apply it. And now I've got a much cleaner look through here with a miter. Um, what if I change that to a style two? Okay, again, it's still cleaner. Okay, so you have different options. Now, the corners is a level-specific um, feature. So what happens if you don't have that? Okay, well, down here, let's play with it without corners. All right. I actually did these all fast, and you can see here, kind of wonky. But just to show you what you can do is, let's say I took this shape, and I drew it and realized I had a mess here. Well... You'd have to redraw it. I'm just going to split the element, all right? Because I believe split is also something you don't have. So if you don't have split, what you want to do is add your points and just create it so it's not connected, all right? Now that it's this way, I've got a look here, right? Okay, so it's overlapping. It's still maybe not as clean as you want it. So what do we do about it? Well, I can add some points. And let's delete that and delete this.
maybe I can select the point. Oh, there it is. Delete. Okay. So now what options do we have? All right. So I want to get fill in this area to hold down my since you are dashing, shall I, I ask if you, oh, that's someone else. Sorry. Okay. So what do we do here? All right. Well, I'm going to use a column input, select input one right here, and let's just do our own cap. So I'll go from there to there and I'm eyeballing, which is going to make it wonky, but oh well, you'll get the idea. All right. So I'm going to change that to a tackle. All right. So what do we do here to make it so continuously without trims? Well, I can update my trim and you see it already did it for me. But if I look at what's actually happening, it's going to, I can tell it to start here and there and then take my cap and let's start it where that one ended and up there. Okay. So again, that's one way we could clean it up. Well, what if we don't want a um, cap like that? What if we want it to miter? All right, again, I'm going to use a column one. I just like a column one. So my previous element ended here. So I'm going to come up and create half my miter. And again, I don't want that type. I want to tackle. I ended up here. So I'm going to create another one starting and going back down. Okay. And I should just change this beforehand instead of keep on monkeying with it. But Okay, so again, I've got these two. I want it to go be red with this guy, with this guy here. Yeah, so I'm going to make them all red, maybe. Oh, I put them with the wrong guy. Oops, there we go. Okay, so all I'm doing is grouping them together. Why? So I can make sure that it sews continuously without trims. Nobody likes it when it's going to have trims in between things. Okay. So that's digitizing all these features manually. All right. So it's, I can get the same look that I do up here. It just takes me a few more clicks. Okay. And you've got to think about it, but you know, I always like to work with the tools we have or I have. And then when I, kept on bumping into the limits of the software. That's when I upgraded personally. All right. So what else? So that's the corners. So the, what was the question now that I lost my train of thought? Okay. So how can we m get rid of this mess? All right. So hopefully that helps some. If not, let me know and I'll show you a difference. Um, is there a best place to put a tie in or tie out with small lettering? Sometimes the last stitches, in a letter start unraveling. Um, there are a lot of good, really excellent resources on small lettering. Um, I find that it's really not the place per se, it's more the type of tie out and tie in that you're doing and what type of underlay you have is what I find. So depending on the size of your letters, um, I've got this is from one of the help articles showing you the type of knot that will work best, the size of the knot. You can see for small lettering, the width of six, a style one, minimum stitches of three, you know, things like that. So same with your tie. If you go super small, um, notice the width, the size of the tie out goes down when you're using tiny threads. And so those are some recommended settings for you that you can use. If you're not familiar with where those are, let me just show you. So I've got some lettering here. If I double click on it and I go into my tie in and tie offs, here are those settings. So I would change these down depending on what size you're working with and what, you know, and you create those and that would change your knots for here. Um, hmm, that's a good question. I'll look at that in a minute. All right, so what else? This one. Oh, back to my resources on small lettering. So like I said, it's to me, the reason it comes unraveling is more a feature of did it tie a knot? Do you have the right style knot? Um, are the settings for your knot correct? Your tie in and tie out. I like calling them knots. They're tie ins and tie offs. All right, so here's where you can find some resources. I can show you how to navigate, you know, just Google for them, but 
let's show you. I have the little links there, um, but here you go. If you go to the Zendesk, so how did I get here? I went melco-service.com. I clicked on the FAQ. And then I typed in small lettering. Searched. And that first one. There's a really good class that Scott did on small lettering. So you can watch that. Has a lot of, you know, hows, whys, different settings and whatnot. The tie-ins that I was just showing you, that's what I would really think is more important, most important for you on making sure your things don't come undone. And of course the underlay, which is covered in these videos. Okay. And then, yeah, like that just takes you to the other article where it has the recommended not um, tie-in and tie-offs. All right. So let me close that stuff. All right. Um, when doing a monogram on a velvet material, do you do a knockdown stitch? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, why do I say I don't know? Because it really depends on the material itself. Uh, they, the velvet has every the ones I've worked with. I don't use it personally. I just use a topper and make sure I have a decent underlay um, because it, the nap isn't high enough to where it's the I don't know what the velvet's called that texture, the nap of it, isn't going to eat my material or eat my thread, my stitching. Unless it's super small, of course, then I guess it could. But um, I tend to just have decent underlay, use a topper. That way it kind of crushes the velvet as it's sewing. And then, you know, the rest of it kind of puffs up around it. Now, if the material itself is going to overlap or kind of want to go in over your text, that's when a knockdown or a global underlay, a primer stitch, whatever you want to call it. Um, that is when you would consider using that. Um, the look of a uh, underlay like that is something that some people like and some people don't. So I always try to minimize the use of it unless I have to use it. It's just personal preference. Um, it does help a lot for a lot of applications though. Okay. Um, I will be honest, this one, whoever, I'll, I'll find to where this question came from. Um, I don't know, I don't understand the question, so I can't answer it. Uh, let's see. Often I'll create a file in another program. Okay. And then to create center lines that are used by Bravo. That part I don't understand. Um, yeah, I'd, so if maybe if you have an example that you can either um, email to the team or some screenshots you can post on your question, I'm just I'm having a hard time understanding what it is that you're trying to do, um, so I can answer it. Uh, I'm going to ask, but I already know the answer. The estimated readout time is always wrong. What's up with that? Uh, there's a lot of factors that go on. Um, I know, you know, how fast are you running? Um, what's the design, the, t the types of stitches in the design. There's so many factors there. I know I always use it as a thumb in the air to get a really rough time and then just ignore it and move along. Um, it finishes when it finishes. And I can, based on the stitch count, guess about how long something's going to run. Um, I think why there's just so many factors that go into it that, you know, it's going to continually change the active feed, for instance, and then the speed's going to continually go up and down based on that. So it's always going to keep changing. That would be my best <laughs> way to explain it. It's, I don't know, I've always used it as a reference and nothing more than that. So someone did type in, how do you set up a hoop to default to a certain size? Do you mean with um, within OS or within um, Design Shop or both? Um, I did. So in OS, it'll stay with whatever was last run, with whatever was last set. So if you want it to be a certain hoop, you know, you would select that hoop and when you restart it, it'll come back to that one. Okay, in Design Shop, well, let's see, I don't know that I've ever messed with that because I just ignore them and set whatever hoop. So, the, I wonder if you can do that. Hmm. Oh, yeah, right here. Okay, so, 
I don't know if this works. Let's try it. <laughs> so currently, if I turn on my hoop, it gives me a circle. What size circle? If I right click on that icon, it'll bring up the hoop manager. And that's the 5.85. So let's change it to something else. I'm going to change it to a 12. My 12. No, I don't like that hoop. Let's do that hoop. All right. 17, the 11 by 17. And I'm going to say set as default. I'm going to click that button, hit apply. OK. I'm going to close design shop because that'll see if it actually set it as the default. It doesn't stay. Hmm. All right, so let's try this. Um, I'm I don't know the answer, so I'm just playing to see. I'll have to ask the guys. All right, apply. Okay. Why well, don't I don't think it has anything to do with these. Save current settings to defaults permanently. Oh, excellent. It's, there's a bug, so I can quit playing. Sorry. Nope. All right, so apparently the it will not save. Uh, how do I reduce the size of designs without distorting? Okay, so I'm going to go open. Usually when you get designs from customers or from a digitizer or whatever, it's going to come in an EXP format, okay? Or DST, but I don't know. Let's say it comes in expanded format, all right? When you do that, um, you there are no wireframes associated with it. It's literally just a bunch of coordinates showing you where stitches go, right? So if, you know, if you've never seen this, there's actually a stitch tab here that shows you where all the stitches go. <laughs> These are all the coordinates, you know, how far it moved for each stitch length, all of that fun stuff. Um, all right. <coughs> so when you go to scale, um, rule of thumb is you really want to avoid scaling designs that are expanded formats more than about, I would say, 10 to 20 percent. Um, you could probably do a little bit outside that, but I always try to minimize it because when you start scaling, um, you'll get, you know, stitches get closer together. Yes, the software will do some adjustments there, um, but, you know, you'll get, you may end up with super tiny stitches if you go too small. If you go too big, you might not get the coverage you wanted. So just, you know, I always try to scale with caution, all right? How do you scale without distorting it? Well, select the design. Down here, if that's locked, um, let's say I want to make it 3.2. I can type in the width, and because that's selected, the design will scale up to 3.2. Okay. Now, if I just want to drag it, so left click and drag, well, you notice it's allowing me to scale in different directions, which is obnoxious. I want it to stay locked in X and Y. So if I hold the shift key down, that locks X and Y. If I hold shift and alt, that shift locks X and Y so it scales uniformly. Alternate makes it scale from the center point. Okay. Um, another way you could do that, right click, go to scale. Over here you can scale by number, by percent. You can also do some limited adjustments with density and pull comp and things like that. All right, so that's under the scale tab. Another, yet another way, there's a lot of ways to do things. Let's say I want to scale this. All right, I'm going to close it. No, let's reopen it because I want, let's say this is the design our customer provided and we need to scale it down 20%. All right. Well, I don't know about you, I'm not doing math to see what 20% of that number is. So I select the entire design. I click on the W or the H. And this it doesn't matter which one, it brings up the same screen, just moves it around. All right. So if you select that, let's say you want to scale the width by 20% down. So that means I want 80% of what it currently is. So I'm going to say 80%. Hit enter. Boom. It's 
lower. Now, like I said, you've got to be careful when you're going super big. You know, if I'm taking a three inch design and wanting to sew it at a, oops, yeah, at a width of 10, um, that's not a smart idea. It wasn't digitized for that size. And you can see it, you know, I'm going to have to do a lot of modifications or even redigitizing sections for that to work. Um, it's best to stick with your scaling to no more than, you know, I try to stay within 10 to 15 percent, but um, I know some people go as high as 20 to 30 percent, but really that I find that to be the limit that I would recommend anyway. All right. Uh, so we got a question typed in. What is Smoko? Uh, Design shop now. All right. Why does Melco OS shut down when you load up DST Jeff for PES files? Well, Melco OS is it won't uh, PES files Jeff files aren't digitized. So if you try to load it to the machine, it's not a file the machine can accept. You need something that's designed. Um, I believe what you're asking is really why does Design Shop crash? Um, I couldn't answer you. It's, I know when there are, um, there's nuances depending on what version you have. If you don't have the latest, if there's vectors in the file and you start bringing stuff in, it, the vectors will do weird things and there's, you know, just strange stuff there. Um, but if you have the latest, there's been bug patches, so if you update to the latest one, um, a lot of that goes away. I also find just personally, what I've noticed is if you're running on slower computers um, that don't have dedicated graphic cards and things like that, um, you can get where it's just not fast enough to be able to process the data. Okay, you have the latest. Um, if you have PES files, I avoid like the plague. Um, it's There's things in them that annoy the daylights out of me. Those, it, they'll add center stitches um, to designs, which then I have to go cut out or edit out. It's, I just avoid them. It's a personal preference. Um, saying that as a person, not as <laughs> from Elko. I just don't like them personally. So I tend to use DST, EXPs, or LFM files personally. If I want color information, I'll end up using Jeff or... Um, oh, you said Jeff there, not JPEG. Yeah, your car, your computer should be fine. <laughs> um, if you've got a file that has, it's doing it for you. If you can email it to applications at Melco, um, that would be helpful, so we can track it down um, or you know figure out what's going on. Um, like I said, I don't see it personally, but I also use most of my own files. So, uh, what other questions do we have? Sorry, I'm staring at the questions on my other monitor. Um, I'm getting the message. Color ch cal change. Oh. All right, so the question is, ah, Malco has a suggestion for you on crashing. All right, I'm getting a message. Color change calibration values do not match the current values in the machine. Verify all color change values are correct before running this machine. Um, okay, so that means the data in your computer that you're running, um, that's running the OS, and the compute, the data in your machine don't match. So, what did I just say for you? <laughs> so, this is uh, all right. I'm getting into kind of tech tech stuff, so I apologize. I'll try to make it as understandable as possible. So, you know the locations of the needles. Each needle can be calibrated um, left to right. Chris um, did a video recently, uh, and it's up on YouTube, on how to do needle case calibration. All right. When you do that, what you're doing is you're setting the position of your needle relative to your bobbin case, because if it's off, you'll all kinds of issues can happen. So if you haven't seen that video, it's a fun one to watch, good one to watch, to better understand needle case calibration. But if by accident you hit some key codes on your key, on the keypad, or if um, you did the calibration and forgot to go get the table, then what's saved in the software on the computer and what's saved in your machine won't match. So it's just telling you, hey, um, 
your machine might not behave how you think it should because we have a disconnect here. Figure out which is right and fix it. That's all it's telling you. Um, so how do you figure? How do you fix it? Well, over here, um, if I go to Tools, then I go to Maintenance. Over here, there is a Calibration tab. This is for your needle case calibration. So if you've gone through and um, changed things, you can go and say Get Table, and that will get it from the machine. So if your machine's running fine and you're just getting this error and there's nothing, you're not doing anything, you're just ignoring it and sewing, I would suggest just get the table. That will get it from the machine and save it in the OS and that error will go away. Um, best bet though is just to check your, your needle case calibration to make sure it's correct before you do that. Um, if you know the computer's right and you accidentally change stuff on your machine and you don't like that, you want it to go back, you can set table and that'll take what's in the computer and push it to the machine. Don't do that unless you know for sure you want to. So I would suggest either get it from the machine or better yet, check your needle case calibration and make any adjustments. And if the calibration's right, then get table. Okay. Um, yeah. What else do we have? The palette of thread colors and design shop that can be changed to a custom palette for the thread colors I already have. Yeah, you can change them. I'm not sure I understand. Down here, if you right click, you can load custom palettes. You can um, take a palette and save it out and create your own. You can modify these boxes here by right click and go pick another color. So each one of these boxes, if I right click on it, that'll show you what it's currently set to. I can pick something else. So yeah, you can change the palettes. You can create your own. Um, I know I created my own color chart for fabrics <laughs> that I have because I, um, so these are all just fabrics I stock. So it's you can create all kinds of stuff and save them over here. What other questions do we have? Back to the software crashing. Um, who, I don't know who's on the other end of the computer at Melco site because I'm not at the same site. Um, they made the suggestion of make sure your video drivers are up to date. So if you haven't done that, um, if you don't know how to, contact Melco, um, the service department. They can help, they can help you out, um, or Google's always your friend. But um, the guys at Melco are more than happy to help. All right, any other questions? And that's what I'm staring at. So make sure. Okay, well I don't see any typed in. Um, again, remember to send us your questions. Type them in. Uh, I do. Oh, hi Scott. So I do try to review the questions um, from the previous week to make sure I catch any um, that might have been missed. I know one of the, at least one from today, was one that I missed last time. Uh, send them in to applications at melco.com. Scott, I believe, is posting these events on approximately Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday. So when you see them pop up on the Melco page, type in your questions there. Um, I check all those, you know, Thursday and Friday up to a few minutes before the, um, the session to be able to answer any questions for you and to make sure I can find the answers. Okay. With that, again, my name is Samantha and I'm part of Melco's application team and, you know, in this fun time of year, happy sewing. I know it's kind of hectic. Try to enjoy it. <laughs> um, I'm excited because I finished all my sewing through the 17th as of yesterday. So I actually have a weekend where I don't have to sew, but I'm going to keep sewing to get ahead. <laughs> so um, you guys enjoy your holiday and I will talk to you next week if there's no other questions. All right. Bye all.